Hello students, I am Radhika Chitkara and I work as a researcher in a gender justice and human rights organization. In the previous two modules, we have explored how human rights obligations can apply horizontally between the relationships in private actors themselves and not necessarily governing the relationship only between the state and the individual. We have argued how potentially corporations also could fall within the ambit of this human of the horizontal application of human rights. Here we analyze in detail a little more on the manner in which these on the manner in which these obligations could apply to corporations, especially given the current neoliberal paradigm of economic development. We pay some special attention to corporations because the application of human rights obligations upon them arise in a very different context than the obligations upon private actors in relation to the rights of women, for instance, and employ an entirely different model of application of uh, obligations than in the former case as well. So through the course of this module, we will address four pertinent questions. First, we will assess the need for the human rights regulation of corporations by analyzing the economic and political paradigm of globalization and neoliberal policies and the challenges that they pose to human rights law. In the second portion, we will analyze the inadequacy of state responsibility in the context of affixing uh, human rights uh, obligations upon corporations. In the third, we will analyze the philosophical justifications for extending uh, such obligations upon corporations. And then lastly, we will uh, dwell, uh, dwell at some length on the models that can be used in affixing such responsibility. So what does it mean when we say that the neoliberal paradigm has led to an in a massive increase in the corporate power uh, of uh, in the corporate power of organizations in comparison with states we have noticed that there has been a stunning increase in investment by multinational corporations in developing countries the level of this investment and the returns on these investments often exceed the, the gross domestic uh, product of several other countries around the world, giving them an immense economic muscle within that area. We know that the, this economic muscle that they have gathered through the modes of such investments have often tended to overpower the authority of the state as well. We also know that the uh, that the, w, the international organizations such as the World Trade Organization and the International Monetary Fund have continuously advocated a change in national policies of, de of the developing world in order to make their climate more hospitable to foreign investment. And we have also heard several accounts of gross human rights violations by transnational corporations in developing countries. Living in India, we find it hard to overcome the tragic consequences that ensued after the Bhopal gas tragedy in 1984. We have also heard several accounts of the manner in which corporations have been funding the conflict in Sierra Leone and reaping the benefits through what have now come to be termed as the blood diamonds. We also know that uh, that the Enron Corporation, in the pursuit of setting up uh, an, an uh, electricity plant in Maharashtra, undertook grave, uh, undertook grave force in, in quelling dissent against the project within the indigenous community, which inflicted massive harms to the right to life, liberty and property of the citizens in Maharashtra. We also know that similar activities were undertaken by Shell in Nigeria, when the local population raised in protests against their activities in uh, activities pertaining to development in Nigeria, often using police forces and paramilitary forces to quell these dissenters. So the accumulation of this economic muscle and the, and the gradual networking in the globalized world of capital and investments has led, to Susan, has led Susan Strange to argue what she calls the retreat of the state. 
she argues for a recognition that power is not exercised merely politically but can also arise economically. So while states are traditionally imagined to be the centers of political power within a domain, it is now markets and corporations that exercise a competing economic power within the same domain. The new economic order accords more relevance to markets and, uh, than it does to the states, which is why states are now increasingly being viewed merely as intermediaries between the global capitalist forces and the citizens and rolling out a red carpet to invite uh, foreign investment within the country without necessarily regulating the manner in which these corporations conduct their business in the domestic territory. Consequently, with the expanse of the operations and the functions of these corporations, they have come to wield far more power over the everyday life and the well-being of citizens than ever before. But even as Susan, Strange, uh, Susan Strange's argument over the retreat of the state has been critiqued by other authors by, by positing a slight, uh, by who otherwise argue that the relevance of the state is not as diminished as Strange might argue, we nevertheless know that their economic power is something that has posed significant threats to the human rights of individuals that come within, the, within their governance. We also know that it is necessary for corporations, and they have historically also, conducted their business and their operations within the umbrella of a legal paradigm specified by a domestic state or by the international community, etc. These manifest themselves through laws on minimum wages, on trade unionization, on outlawing child labor, etc. So legal regulation of the conduct of business is not unheard of and is in fact regularly practiced across the world. But what is different now is that the sphere of influence of, the, of these corporations are much wider. The impact that their actions have now exceed the immediate entities that interact with them. While earlier their actions could have directly impacted employees and families of their employees, now their impact also extends to citizenry, in, uh, citizenry that are associated with their developmental agenda as well. But even as their economic power is increasing, why is it necessary to attach obligations upon the corporations themselves instead of proposing a model for state regulation. We know that when it comes to corporations and attracting investment, state regulation as a model has failed tremendously. And these are for several reasons. The first is the overpowering desire of, of states and governments in the developing world to attract foreign investment. This has led to a domino effect in their internal policies regulating, uh, regulating business and the human rights of uh, of employees and other entities that come in uh, interface with business. So for instance, countries in the developing world are engaged in what is called a race to the bottom to provide the more, most lax and easy norms and standards within which businesses can conduct their operations. This means that minimum, wages, minimum wage laws are relaxed further. Laws pertaining to hiring and retrenchment are relaxed further. Laws pertaining to the kind of climate in which business can be conducted are, more, are made more conducive to the demands that the corporations and investors might place themselves instead of the consequences that might befall citizens and consumers of that business. But not only that, the developing world nevertheless, governments in the developing world nevertheless, lack the resources to monitor acts of these corporations and demand compliance from them. Given that their operations often ex are mammoth in scale and exceed countries, it is difficult for governments to be effectively uh, able to regulate the conduct of these uh, enterprises. But in their enthusiasm to attract foreign investment and foreign investment and economic growth, 
Several developing countries have been known to give de facto control to corporations over large tracts of land or over large areas, including the people that reside in those areas. We have instances of how this de facto control was ceded to Shell in Nigeria when it was allowed to deploy police and paramilitary forces of the, of the Nigerian government to its own uses. It was permitted in turn to raise its own uh, security and defense forces to ward off any kind of dissent or opposition that might arise to the operation of Shell in that area. They are also largely at liberty to employ resources residing in that area as they deem fit without much intervention from the state at all. We also know that due to the transnational nature of the operations of these enterprises, they tend to be largely independent of state control. This means that they might have headquarters in country A, with operations running in country B, C and D, subcontractors from whom they op obtain their products and their resources from in country E, and consumers in country F. In such a scenario, it becomes difficult to ascertain which of these countries can legitimately and effectively e exercise control over the functions of the state. This problem is compounded by the fact that the laws of the state can only extend territorially and cannot really have any impact on the consequences of corporate action extraterritorially. Which means that if the host state finds it incapable to take action or provide redress, none of the other states can accordingly take any action to provide relief to those who, uh, who's, uh, who, who might have uh, suffered at the hands of, the corp of uh, corporate actions. And there is a specific kind of challenge that, that corporations pose in the extractive industry. We know that they pose a competing claim over resources between indigenous populations and multinational corporations. So while governments might authorize corporations to extract minerals and other resources from a certain geography, indigenous populations and tribal populations that have traditionally survived with the aid of those resources and whose rights to property of those resources might not be recognized by the state to the same extent that the state might be able to recognize the rights of the corporation over those resources, state action becomes difficult in that scenario. Consequently, there tends to be large-scale displacement of people from areas where they otherwise conducted their livelihoods and resided to other areas where they might not be afforded the same kind of protection and uh, continuing employment. There are also several other challenges that, uh, that state regulation of corporate behavior poses now that corporations are undertaking a range of different functions. In several areas, there is an increasing privatization of essential state functions themselves. Corporations are increasingly involved in providing nutrition, healthcare, education. There are also instances of corporations stepping in to provide essential service, essential state functions like policing and prisons. The experiment at Abu Ghraib, where the American, uh, where the American government outsourced the setting up and management of prisons to a private corporation, and the ma and the ensuing torture that is perpetrated in those uh, in those prisons, when that came to light. It created an international hue and cry over the manner in which essential state functions could be, conduct, uh, could be conducted by private organizations. So while the conduct of torture is, prohibit is prohibited by the state, there is no clarity on whether, on whether states can then outsource these functions to private organizations and rid themselves of responsibility. Simultaneously, there are several instances of corporate sponsorship or participation in conflict situations. At the time of the Nazi regime, when, uh, when the trials took place, there was significant debate over the, prod over the use of the chemical gas Zyklon B, which was used to exterminate Jews at a large scale. 
Zyklone B came from a, uh, came from an enterprise that was fully cognizant of the use to which this uh, to this uh, of the use to which this chemical gas would be put, but nevertheless continued to supply the gas to to an end that was grossly violative of the human rights of the Jewish population in Germany and other and other places. We also know that uh, that corporations in South Africa contributed to, participated in and greatly benefited from the apartheid regime that was prevalent for the longest time, which discriminated between uh, granting legal rights uh, and therefore access to several resources to, uh, person, to persons of African origin or the black population within Africa, South Africa. We have made mention of the uh, blood diamond controversy in Sierra Leone earlier as well in which the participation of, uh, of corporations greatly fuels the conflict even further. So, we now enter a zone, having, having analyzed the need for fixing human rights obligations upon corporations, given the power that they can exercise, not only economically but also politically, over the territories and the populations in which they conduct their business. We now, enter, we now enter into a discussion of how philosophically we can justify viewing corporations as duty holders under human rights law. To revisit our previous module for a moment here, we analyzed the three presumptions that underlay limiting duties of human rights only to states. First, that states represent the greatest danger to the liberty and dignity of individuals. Second, that domestic legislation in itself is not entirely effective in constraining state action. And third, that domestic legislation is effective in constraining corporate action. We have seen that corporate involvement in human rights abuses over the past few decades challenge all of these three assumptions. State, uh, corporations have assumed greater control and therefore also posit a similar danger to the life, liberty and dignity of individuals comparable to that of states. Domestic legislation has not been entirely effective in constraining, corporate, in constraining private action either. Then in what way can we justify the extension of human rights obligations upon corporations? For this we analyze Joseph Ra's uh, analysis of duty holders and rights bearers uh, in a little detail. Joseph Ra states, and I quote, there is no closed list of duties which correspond to a right. A change of circumstances may lead to the creation of new duties based on the old right. One may know of the existence of a right without knowing who is bound by duties based on it or what precisely these duties are. Through this analysis, Joseph Raz brings the spotlight squarely back on rights and rights bearers. He argues that significance and primacy must always be accorded to the protection and promotion of rights, instead of arguing and debating over who those rights holders are and what the, of who those duty bearers are and what the nature of those duties necessarily are. So if there is a birth of new violations by new actors, then there must simultaneously also be a birth of new duties and new duty holders. Ratner takes, an, takes this analysis uh, and places it in the context of Locke's natural rights theory. He also states that the natural rights theory accords primacy to rights and not necessarily only to duties. The state was created to protect those rights. And the state was granted significant power in the protection of these rights with the guarantee that this power will not be abused uh, to curb those rights. And therefore, the state power was accordingly constrained. The limitation of obligations under natural rights theory, according to Ratner, therefore, is not a matter of doctrine but of circumstance, arguing that wherever there is an accumulation of power, there is simultaneously 
there is simultaneously a curb on that power to ensure that natural rights are not violated. Shooter, on the other hand, takes the analysis of human rights obligations of states entire, in a different direction altogether, viewing corporations not only as holders of negative obligations not to infringe rights, but also of positive obligations, because he views corporations in a globalized world as agents of economic globalization. He invokes the fact that there is an increasing privatization of state functions, that the entry of international uh, enterprises leads to an exit and takeover of local firms and businesses, that that has a massive impact on the domestic market and the supply of essential services like nutrition and healthcare as well. Which, and, not, and he also places great stress on the fact that it is businesses now that have an increasing control over technology and information. Given this characterization of businesses, he argues that, he, that businesses play a mutually reinforcing coercive arrangement with the state. And therefore, they must simultaneously be viewed as agents of welfare and poverty alleviation. Given such a characterization of businesses, Shooter argues that they play a mutually reinforcing coercive arrangement with the state and therefore must also be viewed as agents of welfare and poverty alleviation to meet the goals of development of local populations. Milton Friedman, as a free market proponent, was highly critical of affixing any kind of social responsibilities on businesses. In his words, the business of business is business alone. The only function of businesses, therefore, is to maximize the profits given the resources that they have at their disposal. They are not holders of any kind of social responsibility and are accountable only to the most relevant stakeholder to their operation, which are the shareholders. But he has been extensively critiqued by several authors in the ensuing generations as well. So for instance, Deva argues that human rights obligations do not supplant the free market, which is what Milton Friedman feared the most. All they do is to supplement the free, the free market operations of businesses with certain additional legal obligations. The demolition of the free market would imply that resources are allocated in a manner that the state deems fit. Whereas in the current regime, proponents of human rights obligations upon corporations are not arguing for a regime where state has full control over the economy. economy. Markets will still continue to reign, but with an additional layer of legal obligations upon them. Amartya Sen, on the other hand, critiques this free market regime very extensively by saying that they operate only on a concern with efficiency and not of equity. Accordingly, essential services like nutrition, water, healthcare, education tend to be denied to the populations that most require them within a free market paradigm. The operation of corporations in that paradigm therefore gravely violates the human rights of several entities. Thirdly, it would be incorrect to state that shareholders are the only stakeholders in a corporation. We know that workers contribute a fair amount of their labor and time and are rightly entitled to fair compensation in return for their work. We, know that con we, also, uh, we also know that consumers are essential to the functioning of a corporation by consuming their products. In turn, they are entitled to guarantees against exploitative practices by corporations and businesses. Societies also go a long way in sharing the resources that they own with corporations so that business can be conducted. In return, they are entitled to contractual autonomy and a lack of human rights abuses. But all of this does not specify when corporations should be held liable in the first place, uh, when corporations should be li held liable for human rights abuses. Even if Joseph Raz and Ratner argue for a regime 
in which, uh, in which corporations have human rights obligations. It is unclear in what situations these obligations get triggered. So are they triggered only in case of violations of human rights, of human rights of those people or entities that are directly under the control of organizations such as their employees? Are corporations to be held liable for the actions of their subcontractors as well? Are corporations to be held liable for the direct abuse of civil and political rights? Should corporations be held liable merely by being beneficiaries of state abuse of human rights? Should corporations also be held liable by the mere fact of investing in a country with a bad human rights record? All of these are questions that require a solution uh, to, uh, to appropriately affix human rights responsibilities upon corporations. Because clearly corporations cannot carry the same obligations that states do. So the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission proposed a three uh, proposed a three a model with three stages in which they distinguished the role that corporations played within the apartheid regime. In the first, they affixed the greatest level of responsibility upon corporations that played a central role in helping to design and implement the apartheid regime. At the second level they imposed a slightly lesser degree of culpability upon corporations that made their money by engaging in activities that promoted apartheid and promoted state repression with full knowledge. And thirdly, the least amount of culpability was attached to corporations that benefited indirectly by operating in an apartheid, by in an apartheid society. Ratner, in the current scenario, also poses a three-level distinction between the acts of corporations. First, when the corporation acts in a relationship with the state or the corporation state nexus. Second, their obligations in relationship with affected populations, which is the corporation citizen nexus. And third, the obligation of corporations in relationship with their employees, etc., which is the corporation employee nexus. Stephen Ratner also posits a three-part model of affixing obligations upon corporations. At the first level is when the corporation acts in relationship with the state, which he calls the corporation state nexus. At the second level is when the corporation acts in, uh, in, in a relationship with the affected populations, which is the corporate citizen nexus. And at the third level, is when, they, is when corporations act in relationship with their employees, which is the corporation employee nexus. The responsibility of corporations is greatest when they operate in close ties with the government or the state under the corporation state nexus. So this might be either when corporations are discharging state functions, they might discharge state functions as state agents under the control of the state, or when governmental functions are privatized. This model also fixes responsibility on corporations when they act in complicity with the government to perpetrate human rights abuses. This covers the scenario of Enron in Maharashtra and Shell in Nigeria. And the third level is when corporations assist governments in perpetrating human rights abuses with full knowledge of their actions. And this would cover the scenario of Zyklon B under Nazi Germany. But this model also suggests that corporations will not be held liable for human rights abuses merely for investing or operating in a country with a bad human rights record. Under the corporation citizen nexus, Ratner posits that we must view the relationship of other entities in concentric circles moving away from the corporation. Those relationships that lie in closer concentric circles with the corporations invite a greater degree of, uh, of uh, invite a greater de degree of obligations and therefore liability than those relationships that lie further away. So, for instance, in the immediate circle would lie the would lie the employees of the corporation. In the next circle would lie the families of the employees of the corporation, and the next level will be consumers, and at the last level will be citizens.
This model of a fixing responsibility is premised on the sphere of influence principle, which means that corporations should be held liable for only those acts and violations for, that lie within their sphere of control and influence. This also means that corporations would then be held liable for any kind of violations that are conducted by their subcontractors in different territories. So for instance, if subcontractors discriminate between populations in providing services or the products of that corporations and treat them unequally, the corporation may be held liable. And at the last stage is the corporation employee nexus, where Ratner suggests a nuanced and intricate balancing exercise between the interests of the corporation and the interests of the employee. And this is because corporations occupy a very novel position under human rights law. At the first level, they are rights bearers to begin with, having a, having a keen interest in pursuing the right to conduct their trade and profession and to generate profits. And this is a recognized fundamental right in itself. And in pursuit of this fundamental right, they also have associated front, uh, freedoms of speech, of privacy, of association, etc. But simultaneously, they are now also posited as duty holders vis-a-vis -vis their employees, which means that, that employers must not curb the fundamental freedoms of the employees. They may be curbed only if the employees directly condemn the product of the corporation and damage, it, and damage its reputation directly. And even so, they, are permitted only to, they should be permitted only to take disciplinary action against these violations. However, there are some rights that continue to be non-derogable and, uh, and attach the same liability upon corporations as they do with the state. And these are the rights to life, to, to liberty, the right against torture, etc. Now, there are two models that have been explored in affixing such responsibility upon, hum upon corporations. The first is via voluntary codes and soft law instruments. For instance, the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises in the 1970s or the tripartite declaration of principles concerning multinational enterprises and social policy drafted by the International Labour Organization in 1977 and subsequently revised in 2000, the United Nations Global Compact of 2000, uh, Corporate Social Responsibility, etc. All of these codes are non-binding voluntary instruments that corporations choose to adopt because, the threat of, because of the threat of reputational damage to their business by failing to adopt these, or by failing to abide by the standards that these codes espouse. But at the same time, it has been found that corporate social responsibility casts a very narrow and limited obligation upon human rights and has therefore found to be ineffective. So the alternative is to propose binding legal norms that will cast human rights obligations upon corporations directly. The problem with this scenario is that, as we have seen, domestic jurisdictions are themselves unwilling to hold corporations liable. But even so, the United States Alien Tort Claims Act is a move in the direction of attaching binding legal obligations upon corporations. Thank you.